I want to talk about what happens when a bank throws away a huge number of CRT monitors. They prefer to move on to these thin LCD panels. So what happens to these thousands of old CRT monitors? This is what we discovered in the streets of Mumbai. Once Priya, my wife and I were trolling through the streets, the back streets of Mumbai, and we walked maybe two minutes off from the street and then I turned back and I said, there's something else to this. This is not just a pile of scrap. What was happening here was people were taking these old CRT monitors, they were stripping them apart from most of the components and then reconfiguring them. They were converting these old CRT computer monitors into televisions that can be sort of retrofitted with a t television tuner, comes with a remote control, comes with a whole bunch of new packaging and even a fake cardboard box. It was not just a normal sort of process that was happening in one obscure corner. There were many, many streets in a certain locality in Mumbai where you can buy these kits. And this was really fascinating because it's actually packaged, bundled up in these kinds of fertilizer bags and shipped to remote villages all over India. You were wondering, how do they ship this? So we went and actually tracked down the people who did the logistics for this industry. And what we discovered there was also even more unusual. It's actually piggybacking on passenger buses that have a little bit of empty space, empty slots in them. So they had a completely organized, self-managed system which did not have any kind of digital sort of software behind it, but it was all human chain. And these televisions were deployed almost to all the rural villages of Maharashtra. So you can actually get a color television for almost 30 euros or almost 2,000 rupees, and also with a warranty. Where is this warranty factor coming in from? How do you offer warranty on something that's been salvaged from scrap, modified, and then sent in a passenger bus somewhere? So we discovered one other unusual thing. The kits are so simple to dismantle, assemble, and reconfigure that the knowledge is almost embedded in these products. That was an interesting moment because if you could embed knowledge into products, you can actually allow the products to roam free and people can actually service them wherever they are. So when you make an open system, it allows people to actually build more value onto the product rather than just buying something, consuming it, and trashing it. So this was the cycle that we were interested in. You can go to the streets of Mumbai, you can go to Cape Town, you can go to Doha, you can go to Bangkok. The languages people speak and the cultures in which they exist are so different, but still there's one common thread, and that's the ability to tinker and put all these things together. We we're also curious as to what drives this, really. Where is this value coming from? There's actually an entire industry of low-cost tools and supplies that are manufactured and, and sort of are distributed for this kind of industry. There's also salvaged computer parts and second-hand scrap that you can buy. And it's very interesting because it's a dynamic pricing mechanism where you can actually create different kinds of prices for reliability of components. And you have books and manuals in all kinds of languages. This one is in Thailand. We found it in all kinds of languages. You get almost literal assembly instructions for all kinds of gadgets. What's interesting is that there's traditional crafts. There is like sort of the old traditional crafts that are there in most of these places. And then there's these new technology crafts. These are people who sort of play with technology in very different ways. They don't go to professional schools. They don't go to universities. They actually are taught word of mouth informally at the street level. So what this really gives us is this sort of fix-it locally culture. It gives us cheap fabrication and large math for low cost, which is really, really useful. Because today you can almost have the same computational capability in your pockets, in your average cell phone, as the computer that took man to moon for the first time. So it's like a remarkable phenomena. And what can we do with this was the bigger question. So this is what we call as the sort of silicon cottage industry. And the silicon cottage industry is really about all these kinds of disorganized, highly informally trained, locally organized systems. So this is how the genesis of what we call as Frugal Digital, a small research group at CID in Copenhagen, where we tinker and try out different approaches to these same technologies, and we try to understand how to create the knowledge systems and the products around them. We have done numerous things, like we try to empower teachers uh, in rural schools. We designed a low-cost projector from cell phone parts. You can service them locally. You have a battery pack that drives them, and they can be produced with locally available materials. We've done uh, healthcare tools for frontline workers, health workers, like ASHA workers. Simple things like modify an alarm clock to become a medical screening tool. We have done numerous uh, information democracy products. Like, for example, in South Africa, we've been trying out different kinds of community radio projects that sort of offers us two-way community transmission 
using a cell phone and FM transmitter and a little bit of software inside it. This is something that's undergoing testing at the moment. I want to talk about hearing loss because I think the reasons are obvious, especially in India. I just want you to hear this. This is what an average street vendor experiences 8 to 10 hours a day constantly throughout their working life. And this is a major epidemic. It's a major problem that's not recognized very well. Actually, the WHO released a report that has an estimate of about 6 to 7 percent of the Indian population is actually affected by different kinds of hearing impairments. And this is an alarming figure and it goes pretty unnoticed. We're talking 70 to 80 million people who needs to be sort of checked, who needs to be advised, who needs to be helped. And they don't get that help today. So we were actually analyzing this whole area, this problem area, and we sort of discovered that there's actually small interventions that we can do that can make a huge difference to this process. Today, the process of identification, prosthetic, and therapy is pretty streamlined. If you have a lot of money, you get really great experiences. You get like very well taken care of. But the problem with that is that it requires a lot of expensive equipment, really fancy uh, audiology equipment that needs to be established labs and like testing facilities and things like that. And bulk of the population today cannot reach this. So we said, let's break down the identification process into screening and diagnosis because screening is what's really required for us to identify if someone needs help. With hearing, it's one of those sensory perceptions that you cannot establish yourself or calibrate in your own head whether your hearing is good enough or not. Unlike eyesight or any other sensory experience where you can start seeing where the issue is yourself. Hearing is one of those things that you have to discover over a long period of time if you have really an issue. What we've done is that we've understood what kind of equipment exists today. And this is really fascinating because most of the equipment is either antiquated, cumbersome, and bulky, energy-intensive devices that needs to be set up in specialized places, or there are highly expensive digital gear which needs to have fixed installation and have a very steep learning curve. So we need to come up with a system that's really simple to learn and adapt in a couple of days and you get going. So this is what we try to do as the frugal digital process. We actually took components and systems, subsystems from everyday objects. So we took things from a um, computer speaker, we bought some batteries, we bought some reasonably good headphones, and we wrote a bunch of software on cell phones, Android phones, to sort of see how we can configure all this to become an audiology tool instead. And also we have used local skills. We try to understand if tinkerers and the cell phone repair shops can actually build these kinds of systems. So we actually want to demo to you today a little concept that we've developed. I would like to invite on stage Varun Perumal, who's my colleague, who's been working on this with us. So this is actually a really simple test. You put on this pair of headphones, and yeah. I'm going to play you a couple of notes at different volumes. You just let me know when you can hear them. Mm -hmm. Let's start with your left ear first. OK. Yeah. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Let's quickly move to your right ear. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. So let's take a look at the results. So the app presents all the results in form of an audiogram. This is a highly standardized graph used by doctors and audiometrists all over the world to diagnose not only the extent of hearing loss, but also the kind of hearing loss. Another interesting thing you can do is that you can send all this data via an SMS to a remote location so that medical practitioners and doctors can use this data to perform a remote diagnosis. And also, it creates really interesting opportunities to look at the statistics of how hearing loss is progressing across the areas of test. So I'll send the SMS. Mm -hmm. So you're sending me the SMS? Yeah. Let's see. Ah, there it is. I can see the same audiogram on my device. I might be thousands of kilometers away. And this is telemedicine in a small package in cell phones. And this offers a really unusual combination of different kinds of qualities which can actually allow large-scale screening in all kinds of remote places without the need for huge infrastructure, energy, and big fixed systems. Thanks, Varun. Yeah. Yeah. These kinds of approaches are the sort of new generation of approaches which can make a huge difference to everyday healthcare in a country where infrastructure, energy, and logistics is a huge challenge. What we're doing now is that we're developing these things as sort of programmable hearing devices that can actually be extended, simple devices that can be built in these kinds of cottage industry. 
But the main message that I want to leave behind today is that there's a lot of work and effort and money that goes into large-scale systems and sort of designing experiences in the cloud and all that. But what we really need is to come down to the street. What we really need is street-level computing. And this is what's going to make a difference to almost 700 to 800 million people in this country at least. Thank you so much. Thank you.